Well, let's talk about this case. You you were brought into this case. How and what drove you into defending Dwayne Owen? I was court appointed. I was on the court. You know, I was in private practice. I was um, handling capital cases. I had handled capital cases for a number of years, and so I was court appointed. As you got into this case, what were some of the first initial impressions of it as you began to investigate? Uh, well, first, I wasn't here in 1984. Um, I didn't live here until 1987, so I had not really any knowledge of um, the situation involving Dwayne and what had happened beforehand. Um, so, you know, I was really sort of starting from scratch. Obviously, the case had been tried once before, so I had an opportunity to review that. Um, but those, the trial that I, the case I had, as well as the other case, and his other cases had all been tried before I ever got involved on, um, as counsel on the new trial. As, a, as an attorney in private practice and then now uh, taking us to this point where you were a public defender and representing him on his second trial, uh, what were some of the initial impressions as you began to, to work through this case, knowing uh, the two cases that had already come forward? Well, I mean, just from my experience even at that time, I, of course, um, immediately thought there were probably mental health issues, issues with regards to his background that contributed to what had occurred. And so that was really a big focus of mine is to figure out, you know, how could the, how, how did all of this happen? How, who was he? What, you know, brought him to that place? Who is Dwayne Owen? Dwayne is a very complicated man. I've now known him for 30 years. Um, some very severe mental illness. Um, I think probably as a result of his background that is one of the most traumatic and really heartbreaking backgrounds as a child and growing up that I've ever seen. Um, but being mentally ill doesn't keep him from being really bright, um, inquisitive, um, kind, you know, things that, that people would never see when obviously you look at the cases. Um, so I would say complicated. He has, um, and there, you know, I think we know mental illness doesn't prevent people from also having many good qualities and being able to be bright and have other interests. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to understand how those things can coexist, but they do. When you look at his background, can you go into detail about some of the details of his background that led to your impression of, of mental illness and where he was at and is at? Yes, yes. And, the, and a lot of this really had not been uncovered prior to our work on the case, but, you know, Dwayne was born um, to severely alcoholic parents. His mother died when he was about nine after she, he witnessed her slow and agonizing death from cancer. His father became even more of an alcoholic. Um, they were both, um, well, father was very abusive. There was routine physical and sexual abuse in the home. Um, he witnessed his mother being raped on a regular basis. Um, he had a half-brother who was locked in the basement by his father. And so that was really, he was really surrounded by brutality from the time he was born. He, at the age of about 11 is when his uh, mother died, leaving he, him and his brother Mitch with his dad. His stepbrother was able to leave then because that was the child of his mother. Um, and uh, Dwayne and Mitch then were in his father's care. His father became an even more hopeless alcoholic and ultimately committed suicide in their garage when Dwayne was about 13. They found him in the car in which he killed himself in, in the garage. But out of their fear of being taken away and separated from each other, they left him there for several days. 
Um, but ultimately, obviously, did report it. They were then removed from the home and sent to a uh, orphanage um, when he was about 13. Um, an orphanage that I visited that from the outside looks like a little piece of heaven. It was a beautiful setting in, on these rolling hills, um, the VFW um, orphanage. Unfortunately, uh, as we looked into it, we learned it had been closed down because of the rampant sexual and physical abuse that was occurring to the children who were raised in that home. We found a number of those children who recounted the events that occurred in the orphanage. So Duane went from, you know, a home that was filled with um, brutality um, to a place that was supposed to take care of him where he was victimized further. Um, ultimately, he left there, and that's his older brother left first, ran away, and Mitch came down here to Palm Beach County, and so when Dwayne was able to leave there, Dwayne joined him down here. And that's in Michigan? Okay. Yes, yes. He was, he was born and raised in Indiana. The foster, the orphanage was in Michigan. So in the trial, you, your key point of evidence was mental illness, yes. and that's what you tried, and that's what you defended him on. Yes. I, I know we discussed um, the length of this. Uh, stop me, or, or, or you know, you don't have to cross over this boundary. But is he mentally ill? Yes. Yes. At this point in his life, how do you, with everything happening here, how do you process that with regard to his case and what's going to happen, knowing what y you you feel? Yeah. So I. Th um, I um, think it's wrong that we kill mentally ill people. Um, I, you know, so I, I'm very troubled by the whole thing. Obviously, I'm very troubled by what he did. I was at the time. I continue to be. I have great, great sympathy for the victims and the survivors and the families. Um, you can't feel for one side without feeling for the other side, right? But I don't think killing um, helps prevent killing or really solves any problems. So I, you know, I, I find all of this very, very difficult. Um, he's, you know, his mental illness is not his fault. It was not something he chose. Um, and yet that's really, that's really why we're killing him is because of his actions that were prompted by that illness. Is the he's been in the last few weeks? He has been studied by psychiatrists, and that has come back that he he is not mentally ill, and they're carrying forward with the execution. Do you feel there are some problems with that? That things are missed? Well, yes. I would. I have not read their evaluations. I will tell you that at the time of our trial, everybody agreed he was mentally ill. The judge found. He was mentally ill. Um, all of that was really sort of a given. I think the current evaluations are not because, frankly, there's a number of people on death row who are mentally ill. So I think the current evaluations really are focused on whether he's competent to be killed, executed. And that inquiry is really, does he understand he's going to die for what, <laughs> you know, he was convicted of. It's not really an inquiry as to whether he is mentally ill or not. You, your relationship with Dwayne, you, you represented him, the case ended. Take us from that point until now, uh, how your relationship has evolved with him. So, um, you know, for one thing, getting to know somebody very uh, in great depth in terms of, um, and I think in a lot of ways for Dwayne, the um, inve our investigation and even the trial, um, I think he learned a lot about himself in terms of trying to understand. You know, what we found was several years prior to all of these incidents, he had reached out for help and he understood he had a problem. Um, but at 20 years old, how much insight do you have to mental illness, right? But he did, he did reach out for help, and there was no help. 
Um, and so I think the process that we went through with getting to know him and investigating and finding these people who cared about him in the orphanage, the other children, um, things like that, helped him come to an understanding of how these things happened. Um, and so with that comes, you know, that sort of intimate knowledge of somebody, right? We, you know, continue to stay in touch. I don't know that you can just turn that off. And so we have stayed in touch over the years, both in letters, uh, phone calls. I have visited him a couple of times in the last, whatever it is, 20 years. Uh, my investigator at the time, Hillary Sheehan, who had worked with me on the case. She and I visited him. She also corresponded with him um, up until her um, death last year. When was the last time you saw Dwayne? I saw him last week, I think it was, or the week before. Is he, are you the only person in his life that he has? No. Who else he is has, in his life? He has other friends, some of the people from the orphanage that we connected with that he had not had any contact with. Um, have stayed in touch with him. Um, he has some other friends. He has a friend, um, a dear friend he made um, from Ireland who has visited him over the years. So he's got other people. You know, he pursued, and as I say, sometimes I think people think you're either mentally ill or you can be, you know, smart and all those things, that's not true. So they very much coexist with Dwayne. And he pursued studies in math and physics and space and astronomy. And over the years has corresponded with professors around the country about his interest and study of black holes in space, things that are way over my head, um, and things that we have talked and corresponded about. So. He has certainly had a circle of contacts throughout the years. Is he aware of his actions and what he did? Um, he is, I would say, there's an awareness. It is a different awareness than what we have. Um, Does he know what's going to happen to him on June 15th? And he's, is he prepared for that? Um, I don't know if I can comment on that. I think I think that's probably private that I, for him, I would want to respect his privacy on that. Take us through um, next week as you go up, you'll be going up the day of the execution? Yes. Assuming as we speak to this day, uh, as we film today, that this will be carried out without any uh, appeals uh, unbeknownst to us at this point. What will that be like for you as you start to process that day and moving forward through the evening hours there? I don't know. I have never, I have attended the deaths of loved ones that could not be prevented. I don't know what it will be like to attend the death of somebody I care about that doesn't have to occur. Um, so I don't know. I am you know, there as his legal representative, um, but I'm also there for him to know there's somebody there who cares about him. Is there anyone else that you know, uh, the friends that you, you mentioned, or is anyone else going on his behalf? I don't think anybody else is permitted to go. Okay. They really limit who can be there. When you look at the totality of this case and the impact on your life and and what will happen here. How do you think you'll look back on this, uh, assuming that his execution is carried through and, and, and as you move on in, in your career, and, and how do you process this and relate this to other cases in your life? Because it was such a powerful case for you and personal for you. Um, so I have devoted a lot of my career to cases involving the death penalty, um, clients charged with crimes where they were facing the death penalty um, and had very strong feelings about it. Um, and, you know, I have said to myself, and I'm trying to do this, uh, that I hope to channel, you know, sort of the feelings I have about this into doing even more 
doing even better advocacy uh, for clients who are say who are facing the death penalty. Um, you know, I I do understand. Um, but, well, I I somewhat understand the the desire of victims for this penalty. I don't know that it solves any of the problems. You know, if anything, in so many ways, it makes it so much worse. So I'm, a, you know, I'm a huge believer in forgiveness. It doesn't mean there's not penalties to be paid, but I also uh, don't believe we should be taking the lives of others. And so I hope, I hope to channel, you know, sort of the impact into even better advocacy um, on these issues. I just think that this process and government-sponsored killing doesn't serve us well in terms of humanity. And so, you know, I will continue my efforts. He will remain a special person to me. Um, and so the same way in which I have processed the death of other people I've cared about. That's what I expect to do with Dwayne. Do you feel more treatment options need to be available for those who are, are incarcerated? Absolutely. And those before they get incarcerated. I mean, you know, the judge back in the, who heard this case made that very clear in his final order. What a shame that the people who were charged with the responsibility for helping really hurt and if only there had been intervention when it was pretty apparent there needed to be, um, we probably wouldn't be here. And Karen Slattery would be here, you know, and the others that were injured by Dwayne. So, you know, the, the hope is that today, many years later, we have improved some of those interventions. I think we have, I think we still have a long way to go. Um, but when we scar children, we have to expect there's going to be outcomes that can lead to tragedies. When, you know, you have, we talked about this, when you have read the headlines, um, he's been painted as a monster. Um, the investigators that we talked to uh, felt he was the beginning of a serial killer. He would have killed again. Uh, when you hear that and then you hear the immense pain and the emotion rightfully so from the families and the victims in this case. How do you process that and how do you translate all that with, with your relationship with, with Dwayne? So, you know, I, I, and I think I said this to you before, um, Dwayne, just like everyone, is much more than the worst things he ever did. And it doesn't change the worst things he ever did but it would be simplistic to say that's who he is. He is so much more. Um, and so, you know, I think there, it is sort of easy and, and maybe comforting for some folks to only see him as the worst things he ever did. Um, that isn't who I know, and it's not who I think he is, but I understand the need to to have that sort of black and white view. Mm -hmm. Do you think this case, how will it be studied and looked back on? I've asked everybody I've interviewed this, uh, how will it be looked back on, whether personally, professionally, and, and as we move forward from it, how, how do you think, we'll, what will we learn from this? Well, you know, that's one of the shames to me is that we don't spend enough time trying to learn. That it, it comes down to the sort of um, judgments, you know, guilty, what's the sentence, and that's it. And we could gain so much more if we did want to really learn. And if we did, I think we'd learn how to prevent these things from happening. Um, how, what, what are the signs we should look for? How can we intervene? How can we provide, um, you know, treatments that prevent these tragedies from occurring um, to everybody involved, to everybody involved. So, you know, I wish, 
I often say this, even on you know the the Jeffrey Dahmers, Dahmers of the world and those folks. I just think, as a society, we could gain so much more by studying them rather than sensationalizing their crimes, um, and really try to understand how do we keep this from happening again. And the only way is to understand how did it how did it come about. Um, because just labeling people good or bad, evil or you know, good, doesn't get us doesn't get us to the real the real answers that we need, so that there aren't aren't repeats. And the judge found it all. I mean, it's not like this is just my argument for Dwayne. This is what the judge found in his final order, um, and really, you know in his final order was very clear about, you know, how sad that there was not the intervention and that no child should suffer the way he did. Um, but that doesn't, you know, obviously for a judge change what his role is in evaluating the horrific crimes that occurred. He saw something there, the judge saw something. Oh yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, sort of every, the other doctors all agreed. Um, that there were pretty severe mental health issues. Are you talking to him any time before, like next week? When's the next time you plan on talking? Probably Monday. Monday. And then you'll go up Thursday then? Okay. Because I'm he's not allowed to have any visitors on the day of. Oh, he's not? So you won't actually physically see him then? Do you want to? Yeah. Well, you don't want to go up Wednesday, or would you? He, you know, um, he's got some, I think he's meeting with the lawyers that are handling some of the other proceedings the evening before. Okay. So, you know, we've talked about it, and um, we'll just stay in phone contact. I will say, I've, for my m many years of doing death penalty cases, I've never had anybody on death row, um, and other than Dwayne. Um, and I've never experienced this process since a warrant is issued. It's horrible. This is really bad. We shouldn't do this. You know, they're moved to um, isolation and death watch, uh, um, which everybody calls it that, in front of him, around him, constantly. Within 24 hours of having been the warrant being signed, people were coming in to measure him to start asking what he wanted to do with his belongings. Um, you know, just a little, a little cold and procedural when we're talking about extinguishing somebody's life. Um, you know, it's not to say he's unrealistic. Um, and so, but I just, I think, we could just do better for people. Um, you know, the old saying, you don't teach people not to kill by killing. And I think that's, 